damn, damn, damn. Oh, thank God. I wasn't sure if I had eighth inch or quarter inch ABS. Good thing I had these cheap calipers handy. Now they might not be accurate down to the micron, but I swear, if you pick up a cheap set of these calipers, you'll find yourself measuring everything with them. I don't want to talk about it. Now to date, we've updated the Boogie Shop Truck's power panel that nobody gave a shit about, installed a head unit that nobody respects, and installed some component door speakers in a video that was way too long. But today, I'm gonna to make up for all that with a spicy amp install. I'm so excited for today's installment, I trim my nose hairs. Warning, do not let your old lady watch this video due to high likelihood of steamed clams. Viewer discretion is advised. Now, a lot of people like using fuses to protect all their wiring, but here's why I like breakers. If I make a bonehead move and ground a hot wire, all I gotta do is reset the breaker. And anytime I'm working on something and I'm not being a bonehead, I can just disconnect the breaker like this. How hard is that? Oh, some handsome devil left a turn point down here. And no, it wasn't Gary. This is the location that the amp's gonna mount to, right underneath the seat. This will be the mid-range amp, and the amp for the subs will be underneath the passenger seat. Since that brilliant forward-looking person left that lug on the frame rail, I'm gonna bring the power up through the floor. Got this sunken spot right underneath the driver's seat that'll be perfect for that. So now I'm gonna knock a hole in the floor to pass the bulkhead through. Before I get too far ahead of myself, got this mount down in this little valley. I believe this is where the jack for the spare tire was mounted, so I gotta get that thing out of the way first. Then I'll drill a hole for the bulkhead. Ooh, look, a nickel. Who says you can't make money on YouTube? After liberal use of the three C's, which of course are care, consideration, and curse words, maybe just get that bracket out of here. Make a heck of a mess out of the floor while I'm doing it. So to pass the wiring through the floor, I'm gonna use a bulkhead connector. Just drill a hole with a hole saw. This baby passes right through. Then you tighten up the nut from the backside, and you're done. These are the four runner seats that I've mounted in my truck. Took the bottom seat cushion off so I could see where the amp was gonna be down below. Now I wanna lay out the amp rack down here and make sure that it doesn't get into the bottom of the seat. So let's take a quick measurement. Got about three inches over here where this cable comes across for the seat slider release. The opposite side, it's more like four inches. Got a rib right here I can mount to, a rib here, and I might have to run a little spacer down to the floor because this side's not touching anything. This is part of the valley that leads down to where the power is coming out. Now the way that works for me is when the amp is secured down, I need to get a power wire out through this valley to come up to the distribution block. So far so good. Got the backer panel all cut out. Mark the sides with some tape. So I can come in here, mark where the ribs are on the floor, drill this panel out so I can locate the rib nuts that are going to hold this panel down. In case you hadn't figured it out already, the amp mounting plates are going to be made of quarter inch ABS. Drill them out for quarter 20 fasteners and countersunk the holes a little bit. So I could use bevel head screws to keep the mounting surface flat. Plates back in place, use the deburring tool all the way around the edges, countersunk the screws. It's time to locate a spot to drill for rib nuts. It's always going to use a transfer punch. Now at this point, I was having too much fun to realize that I was drilling the wrong size hole for the quarter inch rib nuts. Uh oh, I think I pre-drilled the wrong size. Fuck! Luckily for me, I'm gonna just drill them out of 3 8 I am gonna replace these with Phillips heads just so I don't have to get an Allen and a Phillips head anytime I wanna take this plate out. That'll just plain be annoying. Still need a little support in this corner. I got just a plan for that. First, Cut the head off a perfectly good quarter 20 bolt. Then, chuck the bolt into the drill press and sharpen it with a grinder. 
ejecto cito, cuz. Thread the sharpened bolt into the rib nut, put the amp plate back in for the 49th time, give the plate a little love tap, then bore your adoring wife with how smart you are. To split the power coming into the cab, using a Steve Mead Designs distribution block. I'm locating it close to the back of the seat so I can get to the fuses if I ever need to pull them out. Remember those kicker components that were installed a couple videos back? Well, this is what's gonna power those hogs. A genuine American-made, Korean-made PPI 2360. And this old school beauty was generously donated by my boy, Ghetto Fabulous T Large. But due to space constraints, I'm gonna run this down for sound JP84. That's a big J, a big P, a big eight, and a little four. Now this amp is much smaller. What? The PPI fits? Now this old school four channel, this old school two channel puts out 180 watts by two, which is a lot. A lot more than those kickers are rated for. It'll be fine. Now for the subs, my man Rick Rockefeller donated an old kicker amp. But, but, but I really needed more power, so I picked up a Down for Sound JP8. This little monster puts out 800 watts RMS. But in reality, this little bastard put out 1200 watts on Big D Wiz's amp dyno. Which is a lot. A lot more than I need. So that kicker amp is out here. It's time to make up all the cables to power the amps in the truck. This is one out New Concepts Colossal Cable. This particular section is going to go from the distribution block down to the bulkhead. Start off by eyeballing this thing and stripping it back with a knife. And just use plain old copper lugs. Slip that over the end. Make sure you get all the strands inside. Give us a little twist and we're on. I bought this little crimping tool off of Amazon when I was putting the truck together for the first time. And tell you what, this thing has been awesome. Pump her up. Tell it won't pump her no more. There you go. Nice clean crimp. Here's the cable we just made. It's gonna go down here on the post. Gets a washer. Block washer. A big old fat nut. Notice on the SMD distribution block, these sides are ganged together, these sides are separate. That means this is the Gazinza side, this is the Gazautza side. In between there are some gigantic damn fuses. For right now, I just want to get all the wiring run. I'll put the fuses in later. I think all these posts are stainless steel, just the way all the hardware goes on and off. So I want to hit these with some anti-seize before I get too wild here. This is graphite anti-seize. Supposed to be the best. I don't know. What I can tell you is, do not get this stuff on your skin because it will absolutely stain you for days. Now that might seem like overkill, but if you thought cutting speaker holes out with a router was a terrible job, getting one of these things unstuck after the stainless steel is galled up beats it 10 times. There we go. Torque to perfection. I already made up the other cables. You don't need to see a whole bunch of crimping. I've selected all the wiring sizes just based off what the amps can take. I'm not going to put any bigger wire into the amp than what it will actually accept. Oh, that's crispy. This just doesn't make any sense. Here's the power wire for the sub amp. One out colossal cable coming in, 8 gauge going over the sub amp, 10 gauge feeding the mids and highs. I marked out the RCA so I could tell them apart. These obviously go to the mid-range amp. I'm going to use some cushion clamps to hold these in place. But I am looking for a better option. Hey, 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 hey,
So now it's time to deal with the sub box. I sanded this thing down, rounded off all the edges with a router, and filled all the screw holes. And I must say, it's looking pretty choice. Now, honestly, I never understood why you'd go to all the trouble to build a really rigid, stiff box for your subwoofers, and then go whack a hole in it, stick some weak ass little plastic cup in the side. Now, I struggled with how to get speaker wires into this box, and I don't have that Evan Wells 07 money. So I'm gonna use bolts like a real man. Damn it, did I get any of those screws in straight? Anyway, like I mentioned, I'm gonna be using bolts to get my speaker wires into the box. Now when it comes to an electrical connection, surface area is everything. If you don't believe me, look up the Hall effect. Anyway, I'm gonna drill a hole in this box on either side, up here in the transmission tunnel area, put ring terminals on a bolt, and run a bolt through that hole. Then I can connect all the wiring inside the box. I drilled these holes out to 7 16 ran a quarter inch bolt through them, Got a washer under the head of the bolt, then the ring terminal, then another washer to give as much surface area as possible. Now at this point it gets pretty tough to show you what's going on because everything's happening inside the box. Speaking of, I'm going to do a quick continuity check, make sure I've got the wires tied together correctly inside the box. That's good noise. What do you think? Should we check the ground? Eh, yeah, why the hell not? Alright, so that's good. All right, there we go. Now wiring these subs is gonna get a little complicated, especially if you're a dummy like me. Got two dual voice coil, four ohm subs. My amp is good to one ohm, so I wanna wire these subs to one ohm. To do that, I'm gonna use a crutch field wiring diagram shown right here. <laughs> It's a moment of truth. Subs are in. Am I a hero or a zero? Looking for one ohm. About 1.3. Now one ohm is nominal, so 1.3 is one ohm. If anything, the amp will run a little bit cooler at 1.3 than it would at one ohm, but that's exactly what we're looking for. Last thing to do before tuning, let's get the seat brackets back in so I can ground the amps. All right, so all the grounding for the cab comes in through these seat brackets. These are a couple pieces of plate that are sandwiched through the floor that I also use to ground the body of the cab. They also make a really convenient spot to ground the amps. Gave these things a fresh coat of paint, and I'm gonna be using all new hardware. For the connections, I'm gonna be using Penetrox Antiox. This is an antioxide coating I'm used to using in the electrical industry. It'll keep out water, dust, and dirt, but this is not a dielectric. It does conduct. Let me give a little, maybe, work with me here. Give me a second. And give just a little coating underneath the washers. So that means my connections will stay nice and fresh and won't get all gross and corroded. Now on the underside, I've got a backing plate that was also masked off when it was repainted. I'm gonna give that thing a coat of antiox and connect it back up to the frame. Now since this is such a special occasion, I'm bringing back a golden oldie, the Boogie Tech segment. Roll the music. <laughs> Voy a cantar esta canción con mucho cariño de mi corazón a la República Dominicana, la casa del merengue y la casa de la bachata. Now there have to be at least a million ways to set your amplifier gain and find the maximum undistorted volume of your head unit. Some people swear by using a multimeter, while others prefer just to set it by ear. After looking at all these options, having a panic attack, and wetting myself, I put on some clean pants and got one of these. This is a Steve Mead Designs DD1 distortion detector. Demore Engineering and Steve Mead Designs got together to make this a little dandy. As the name would imply, you can use this to set the gain on your amplifiers and find the highest volume setting on your head unit before it starts clipping. Now what I'm about to show you is a combination of the instructions that came with the DD1 and information I got from Demore Engineering University's YouTube channel. Anybody still awake? Now this is gonna be like building a plane while you fly it, so come on, I'll show you.
Now to set my gains, I'm combining a couple of the methods we just talked about. I'm going to have the DD1 hooked up looking for a distortion signal. I'm also going to have a multimeter hooked up just to make sure that I'm in the ballpark for the DD1. Now to test with a multimeter, there's a little bit of math involved, but don't let that scare you. To determine the output of your amp, you need to take your resistance in ohms and multiply it by the RMS power of one channel on your amplifier. In the case of the mid-range amplifier, I'm running four ohms and it's 180 watts per channel. So four times 180 is 720. So then I take the square root of 720 and come up with about 28 volts. In case you're really lost on the math, all you have to do is Google the square root of whatever number you've got and the internet will give you an answer. So to sum all that up, I should be seeing about 28 volts AC coming out of the amplifier around about the time the DD1 finds distortion. Enough of that shit, let's get moving. Now from the DD1's instructions, the preferred method for finding the maximum undistorted volume of the head unit is to measure it through the amp. The DD1 comes with a set of test leads, which plug right into the amp. First step, gotta disconnect the speaker wires. Then the DD1 leads go right lead, right speaker positive, then black lead, right speaker negative. Now the DD1 comes with this CD loaded up with test tones. The instructions will guide you through which tracks are better for sound quality and which will result in a louder system. Since I don't have a CD player, I went on the YouTube music application and found out Demore Engineering has this whole disc loaded on there. Since I'm using Android Auto, I can play the test tones straight through my cell phone through Android Auto, exactly the way I'm going to use them in real life. Make sure the gain on your amplifier is turned all the way down. If you have a crossover in your amp, you have to make sure it's set to full range. On the head unit, turn your bass and treble all the way down and set your EQ to flat if you have one. Now this head unit only has an EQ, it doesn't have bass or treble, so I don't have to worry about that part of it. All right, I've got my phone hooked up to Android Auto, ready to play track one, which is a 40 hertz, zero dB test tone. The DD1 is turned on, volume on the head unit's all the way on zero. Once I start playing, I'm gonna slowly turn the volume up on the head unit, and some of these lights on the DD1 are gonna to start to twinkle. Here we go. There's a signal light came on. 40 hertz detect light came on. That's good, it's seeing the 40 hertz signal. Keep coming up slowly till we see the distortion light come on. There it is. Now we just back it down till the light goes out. Light went out at 49 on the head unit. They may have seen the voltage didn't hit the number we were expecting. I probably should have mentioned that that doesn't matter for the head unit. It's now for the second part of the head unit test. Got a one kilohertz test tone queued up. Now we'll repeat the same process, looking to find distortion on the DD1. Thousand kilohertz detect came on. Now we're just looking for the distortion light. Okay, the distortion light never came on. That's a little odd. Now that's a perfect example of some of the frustration I've had with this whole setup. Followed the instructions to a T, did a lot more research, and found out basically there's a million variables. What I found in the past is that 1000 kilohertz test tone would have a slightly higher distortion point than the 40 hertz test tone. So from here on out, I'm just gonna run everything at a maximum volume of 48. 50 is the top for the head unit. I'm never gonna turn it up that loud. Let's move on to the amps. All right, so now it's time to set the gain on the mid-range amp. The head unit volume is still set at 48. Head unit's EQ is also still set flat. The multimeter and the DD1 are still connected to the amplifier's right channel outputs. Amplifier gain is still turned all the way down and the amplifier crossover switch is set to full range. That means this frequency knob isn't doing anything. I should see something like 27 volts AC on the meter, which I better bring down here. Hello, friend. Should see 27 volts AC or so, at that point, this little distortion light better be blinking. Now's the time you gotta make a decision. The instructions will tell you track four is better for sound quality, while track six will result in a louder system. I'm going with track four, at least initially. That's a one kilohertz test tone at five decibels. All right, so one kilohertz detect light is on, the signal light is on. Now we just slowly turn up the gain until a distortion light comes on. Okay, voltage is coming up. That's what we'd expect to see. Now, I'm out of range on the meter, so let's go up a range. Got 22 volts on the meter. 
Yeah, see distortion comes up, we're at 25.6. Come down one notch, distortion light goes off, we're at 22.4 volts. That's the problem with the multimeter method. You can do all the calculations you want, but in the real world, your amp may be putting out more or less power than it's rated for, but at least by combining these two methods, I know if the DD1 is working, and I know if the multimeter is working. I don't know. All right, now we're on to the sub amp. This little bitch gave me the most problems out of this whole setup. Following the DD1's instructions, I couldn't get the distortion light to come on. That's what led me to put the meter on so I could have a clue what voltage was coming out of this amp. So this is how I'm gonna run this thing. You do whatever you want. I've got the speaker wires disconnected. I've got the DD1 and the meter hooked up to the outputs on the JP8. By the way, there's no left or right channels on this thing. There's four outputs, but all the positives and the negatives are getting together. I've got the frequency set at about 40 hertz, the subsonic filter guessed at about 40 hertz, and the bass boost set at about halfway up. I'm also going against the instructions and turning the bass knob all the way up. The JP8 has a little bit of safety built into it. Both on the side of the amp and on the bass knob, you get a clipping light. When I did get the distortion light to come on the DD1, I noticed the clipping light was coming on almost the exact same time. So if I get the gain set a little bit too high, that clipping light should go on right in my big dumb face, I can turn the base knob down before I send one of these cones into an orbit around Jupiter. Now this amp is rated at 800 watts, but I've seen it dyno as high as 1200 watts. So doing the math, I should see 28 to 35 volts AC. Once again, as long as I don't see 14 or 600 volts coming out of this, I can trust that the DD1's in the right ballpark. For tracks, you can choose tracks three, five, or seven. Track three will give you better sound quality. Track seven is a louder setup, Track five is a compromise, so I'm going for track five. It's a 40 hertz test tone at 10 decibels gain. All right, let's break something. All right, so instantly the signal light and the 40 hertz detector on. Seeing two volts on the multimeter. Let's start turning that gain up a little. Once again, you just kind of creep it up, watch it for the distortion light. Reading some of the more engineering stuff, they'll tell you you can see little blips along the way. It's just a short spike in the signal. What you're really looking for is for the light to come on and stay on. Now the little speed bump. There. So the gain knob is probably about two o'clock. Distortion light's on. So now I just back it down till the light goes out. Okay, the light's out, and that did not take much of a turn at all. Now you notice the meter's saying 41 volts. It's a little higher than I really expected. The clipping light on the JP8 is on. So I'm definitely gonna back off that bass boost a little bit. All right, the clipping light went out, showing 38 volts on the meter. So now with the combination of these two joints, you can see why I feel a little bit better doing it this way. My mid-range amp is set a little bit more conservatively than I would have thought with just the DD1. And now the DD1 and the amp clip light both agree there is no distortion. Not to mention my head unit's turned up higher than I'll ever get it. Or will I? Time for tuning. Prior to that last round of gain setup, I did do some tuning to the stereo. It's pretty rough, but it's on the safe side so that I can just turn it up and not have to worry about it. There's just no way to make amp tuning interesting or really informative because there's way too many variables. But enough of that shit. Cock, lock, ready to rock. Let's see what this thing... Did you hear that? corporate. Fuck that guy. Let's send these things into orbit. I sound good. Well, that was significant. I gotta give it up 
to Car Audio Fabrication and Mark Zuckerberg, the car audio nerd, because this thing freaking bangs. I was really questioning whether or not I could get the kind of pressure inside the cab I want, but damn it if it doesn't work. Got a lot of work yet to do. I can hear the back cab wall vibrating against the box. I'm going to have to sound deaden that a lot better. Got some new carpet coming. Just a lot of things to put back together. There's more coming for the audio on this truck, believe it or not. More importantly, I've got some air system stuff I need to redo. So keep an eye out for that video series coming out. And thanks for watching.